1964, we have the Civil Rights Act, which gave us Title VII. So there are various titles. Title VII is the one that deals with employment discrimination and prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, and uh, several other characteristics. And so again, you change the law, but you don't change the world. And so this was uh, officially the law in 1964, but we see that segregation was still going on. And officially from people that I've talked to growing up uh, in the state of Texas and just knowing what we know that it takes time for these things to be implemented. This takes us to 1970 or early 1970s, which is within the lifetime of some of the people on this call or very close to it. And that's really not that long ago. It's really only been these last 50 years or so that uh, we've had legislation that has made things uh, somewhat more fair. And so what this leads me to think is, all right, given the history, given what we know, a history of systemic racism and discrimination, such as what we've just seen in the previous slide that has lasted about 400 years, it creates an entire social structure. It creates a structure of power, of wealth, of social class, of social networks, of education, of a lot of different things that matter in society. And that endures for many, many years, for many, many generations. Another concept that's important here that I talk about a lot in class is social dominance orientation. And social dominance orientation is the degree to which individuals desire and support group base hierarchy and the belief that there should be domination of so-called inferior groups by so-called superior groups. So people who have a high social dominance orientation or SDO believe that uh, it is important to have this social hierarchy. That is how things should work. That is how things should be. And that's how you maintain a proper order in a proper society. And SDO beliefs are an important predictor of discriminatory behavior. I want to show you some uh, research briefly. There are some authors here, Sedanius and Prado, originally published a book about social dominance theory and they've created a couple of measurement instruments, that scales that you give people to fill out questions that assess their level of social dominance orientation. And so they did this as part of um, their work. And I'd like to show you something here. So this is a screenshot from this paper that shows the Pearson R correlations between social dominance orientation and several characteristics. So as you can see, social dominance orientation is related to all of these things, uh, political conservatism, punitiveness, caste maintenance orientation, I have a red arrow pointing here, correlation of 0.65 with racial superiority. And a correlation of 0.65 in statistical terms is a, it's a large effect size. Uh, it's also related to political conservatism and um, down here, what the gender means, the way gender was coded, it means that men have somewhat higher levels of social dominance orientation than women overall which you might expect because in terms of social status, men have a higher social status overall than women. And so hierarchy beliefs would, um, would benefit uh, men, okay? So again, racial superiority is strongly correlated with social dominance orientation or SDO. So in this same study, they looked at different people in different occupations and they assessed their levels of social dominance orientation. And so here on the x-axis, you can see that they looked at public defenders, they looked at university students, they looked at jurors, and they looked at police officers also. These are standardized scores on the y-axis, so mean of zero and standard deviation of one. So if you look at public defenders, they appear to be about half a standard deviation lower than the mean that they found in this particular sample. Public defenders are trying to free people, right? They're, they're defending people and making sure that someone's not falsely accused. 
uh, here in the middle, somewhere in between, we see university students and jurors right around mean levels for the sample that they found. And if you look at police officers, they are uh, a little over one standard deviation higher than the mean in terms of their levels of social dominance orientation. All right, so that's one piece of information. Other information, if we look more broadly at uh, society, some information from the US Census. Looking at current household income, what we see is uh, white non-Hispanic households as of 2013 were earning about 58,000 average income per year. If you look at black households, just under 35,000. Asian households were around 67,000 and Hispanic households just under 41,000. If we look at net worth of families by race, this is information from 2016 from a Brookings report. You can see the average net worth of a white household in 2016 is about $170,000. If you look down here and you look at black households, it was somewhere right around seventeen dollars to $18,000 of net worth. So 10 times more when you look at these households up here. If we look at education as of the major 2010 census, what we see is uh, the rates of high school diplomas here, as you can see, uh, for whites, 87%, African-Americans, 84%, Hispanics, 69%, Asians, uh, who are the most educated group in the United States, 89%, and American Indians, 72%. The same pattern emerges when you look at college degrees. So for uh, white college degrees, 30%, uh, African Americans, right around 20%, Asians, again, the most educated group overall in the population, just over 52%, Hispanic education, college education, right around 14%, and American Indian, right around 12%. We look at overall unemployment as of uh, 2014 from Bureau of Labor Statistics we can see roughly about 5%, 5.3% for whites and Asians. The unemployment rate is more than double. Uh, for African-Americans, it was 11.3, and Hispanics somewhere in between with 7.4. And if we look at incarceration rates, this is the rate of incarceration, and it's per 100,000 people in the population. So for every 100,000 white people, 275 are incarcerated. For every 100,000 Hispanic people, 378 are incarcerated. For every 100,000 black people, 1,408 are incarcerated. So five times more here uh, than what we see here. And so another important concept that I think about when I look at all of this information is the concept of implicit bias, which we've heard a lot about in the media. Uh, sometimes I was just watching the news earlier this week and they're saying we need uh, implicit bias training for our police departments and or we've done implicit bias training already. Um, so implicit bias is basically subconscious bias that is primed quickly and automatically and without conscious thought into your brain. This NOSIC et al. 2007 paper has a sample size of two and a half million observations. 68% of participants who took the black-white implicit association test, 68 participants subconsciously associated pictures of white people with good things faster and people of uh, black people with negative things faster then they could the opposite pattern, while only 14% showed the opposite pattern. And this lie et al. 2016, this is an interesting study that looks at interventions to reduce implicit bias, such as this implicit bias training um, that police departments are doing. 
The interventions to reduce implicit bias wear off after a few hours or days, according to this research, and do not change long-term behavior, which means that behavior needs constant reinforcement in order to not have these biases, these automatic biases that 68% of the uh, population, at least of that two and a half million sample did. All right. So I'd like to bring it a little more toward organizations now, which is the space that I live and work in. And this is the current state of the US uh, workforce, according to McKinsey and Company, based on Bureau of Labor Statistics information. When we look at the workforce, what we see here is uh, the entry level overall workforce is composed 36% uh, of uh, white men and men of color are at 16%, white women 31%, and women of color 17%. So this is overall Bureau of Labor Statistics workforce at the entry level. As we go up the organizational hierarchy, what we see here at the very top senior VP and C-suite positions, uh, white men are 68% of those positions, so substantially overrepresented as a proportion of the workforce. Men of color reduce substantially to 9%, white women reduce substantially to 19, and women of color also a dramatic reduction down to 4% at the top of the organization. So what we see overall is that minority employees seldom reach the top of the organization. Racial minority employees right now compose 33% of the workforce when we look at the Fortune 500, only 4% of Fortune 500 firms have racial minority CEOs, and only about 16% of board of director seats on those firms are held by racial minorities. So I'd like to talk for a moment about the, uh, this study that some colleagues and I published in 2015 that looks at the outcomes of perceptions of workplace racial discrimination and all of the outcomes that it has. This is a meta-analysis, which basically means that it, all samples can be a little idiosyncratic, depending on who you sample. And some samples are larger than others and should be given more weight than others. And so a meta-analysis attempts to find every single published and unpublished paper that's ever been, uh, every study that's ever been conducted with those variables of perceived racial discrimination at work and various outcomes and then you code it and statistically aggregate it and compute it so that you have a large enough number of observations that you attempt to approximate and find that true population effect. So based on all those observations that we found, what this meta-analysis reports is that perceived racial discrimination at work affects your job and your entire life. So in terms of how it affects your job, you can see that it's negatively related as you would expect to your job attitudes, and this is a moderate size correlation. There is a negative and small correlation with physical health, but I'll point out that one of the components of physical health was often your blood pressure, which as we know, blood pressure is actually one of the comorbidities with COVID-19 right now, making you more likely to succumb if you have an elevated blood pressure. Uh, psychological health, it's damaging to your psychological health. So a lot of things like anxiety, uh, stress were in there. Um, also coping behavior down here at the bottom, it's positively associated with coping behavior. And that could be positive ways of coping like exercising and talking to a friend or it could be negative ways of coping like drinking to intoxication or overeating which can lead to obesity over time. So again, it affects your job and it affects your entire life when you perceive racial discrimination in your job. This is also quite unfortunate because I'll share some findings from a study that's in press right now that has two different samples. And what we're looking at here, if you look uh, here on the left, these are uh, the predictors are lower management racial diversity and upper management racial diversity. And we're looking at whether the levels are high or low of the levels of racial diversity are high or low 
in lower management and upper management and how does that affect overall firm productivity? We look at this in a sample of the whole Fortune 500 and what we find, the main point here is that when lower management and upper management are both racially diverse, the Fortune 500 firms are performing the best. The best performing Fortune 500 firms are those that have high racial diversity in both lower and upper racial, uh, upper management, okay? So that was true in the Fortune 500. And on the next slide, it was also true in the high-tech industry. Same exact pattern emerged. So what we see is, again, the best performing firms are those that are diverse at all levels, including the upper management. So by now, I've presented uh, information that probably has a lot of you frustrated because that's the nature of, of this topic. And a lot of the things that I've presented are uh, extremely frustrating because of you know, discrimination and fundamental unfairness that we're talking about here. So here are seven things that work to kind of try and uh, put a, a more uh, empowering, more positive uh, message out there because the research does show us that there are some things that can in fact help and it's important to keep those in mind. And so one thing that helps, this is a study that some colleagues and I published a number of years ago, giving people instructions to focus on job related qualifications as opposed to other characteristics that don't pertain to the task at hand, that helps. So what we did in this particular study, this study had two different samples. One was related to um, sex discrimination and one was related to race discrimination. This is talk about race, so this is the, uh, the finding for race. So what we did was in these experiments that we conducted, we told people that they were going to have to select a team member and they were going to be working with this team member on an interdependent task. And as part of this, they could win um, some cash. They could win a prize, depending on which team performed the best, they could get a prize, all right? And so what we had done ahead of time, we knew that um, we pre-tested several bios or uh, resumes. We had pre-tested them and we did not include any demographic information on the resumes. We only included the qualifications of the different people that they were selecting among. And so based on that pre-test, we had one resume that we knew was definitely better than all of the others. And our pre-test showed statistically significant results that yes, this person is in fact better than all of the others. All right, so then we added the demographics to the resume and we made it apparent that the best person was also African-American, okay? What happened was when uh, the people who were high in social dominance orientation saw those resumes, they really didn't wanna pick the African-American uh, candidate to their own detriment, I would add, because remember the highest performing team with the best people on it could win money. And uh, so, but that's what we found was that left to their own devices, people who have high social dominance orientation were less likely to want to select the African-American uh, resume, which was the best. When the experimenter gave them specific instructions and said, okay, this is what you need to do. You need to focus on job related qualifications because you're about to have to go do this other activity. And it's important that you focus on the qualifications and pick the person who is the best so that your team does well per the qualifications. It mitigated the discrimination. Now you can still see the dashed line here uh, when directives were absent the negative relationship or the tendency to not want to pick that person who's the best as social dominance orientation goes up, it's more steeply negative, but we were at least in terms of when we gave the directives, we were at least able to flatten it a little bit. It's still negatively sloped, but at least the, the, the shape of this improved, okay? So one thing you can do is give people explicit 
information and reminders to focus on job related qualifications, which I think is especially important given that this other study that we just saw a few years ago says also implicit bias training wears off within a few hours or days. So in every decision, every important decision, you have to keep reminding people uh, who are on those selection committees, um, evaluating people for promotion, for everything. It's helpful to remind people to focus on the job related qualifications and not other things that could lead them to be biased if they have this tendency of high social dominance orientation, for example, okay? So that's one thing that works. Here are some other things that work. Inclusive leadership works and accountability for diversity and inclusion works. This particular study looked at 30 years of data in organizations. What they found was that leadership is essential. When you have a leader who role models inclusion the organization will do much better in terms of diversity and inclusion. It's going to be a better place to work. Also, you have to establish responsibility for diversity in the organizational structure. And the most effective way of doing that, uh, of diversity and inclusion, was to hold managers accountable for diversity efforts in their daily decision making. That's the way that they found that diversity initiatives work the best. So specifically for managers who have responsibility uh, over selecting, evaluating, developing, and making important decisions with respect to employees, they have to at every step consider diversity and inclusion and be held accountable for that in their own reviews. And when they speak to their supervisors, they must be held accountable. That's gotta be embedded in what they're doing. So those are three things that work. What else works? Social pressure. Uh, there's, there's a good amount of research that says when the majority of the people, when there is a kind of critical mass of people who support something, it works. So peaceful protest, voting, the things that we're seeing now, that works. And here's an example. So here we have, this is uh, President LBJ. This is Lyndon Johnson signing the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which gave us Title VII, important employment protections that we have against discrimination. And look who's here. This is Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who showed us the way with respect to peaceful protest. It works. And this is a culmination, an example of uh, why it works in terms of putting social pressure one other thing that I'll say is that uh, contact works. So the next slide, meaningful contact. This is a picture that I took with my iPhone when I visited the LBJ. So this is President Lyndon Johnson's presidential library, which is at the University of Texas at Austin. And when I visited this library, I took this picture because it, it's such a, for me, a vivid example of how meaningful contact works. There's something called the contact hypothesis that says that even among groups who don't ordinarily get along with each other, if they have an opportunity for meaningful contact so that they can learn to know one another and to understand one another and realize that they, they have so many similarities and that their similarities are more important than their differences, they become less prejudiced in the way that they act because they get it, they understand each other. And you see a lot of the conflicts and the, the tensions that come from normal social categorization processes, which we do all the time, you see those things start to subside. Well, this is Lyndon Johnson in his first job. When Lyndon Johnson, He's from Texas, and when he left uh, university, his first job was in his little town called Cotula, Texas. And this is from 1928. These are the fifth, sixth, and seventh graders that he taught in Cotula, Texas in his very first job. And so I saw a picture, and I, I took a picture, I photographed a letter that he wrote home to his mother uh, saying, when you send me the next care package, please include this and this and this school supply because this school has no resources 
these children don't have fundamental things that they need uh, for supplies when they come to school. And he was teaching in the segregated school that Hispanic children went to. So he saw and experienced with his own eyes that separate but equal was a total nonsense. It was a lie. And I think in some way, perhaps that gave him uh, a good solid understanding of how other groups are experiencing things. And then, so the same, this man right here, years later, there he is signing uh, the civil rights legislation and the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So meaningful contact works. This is an example. And there's a meta-analysis that also shows that from several years ago that the contact hypothesis works and meaningful contact between groups that ordinarily uh, wouldn't get along very well absolutely works and reduces prejudice in most instances. All right, so what else works? Seeing counter stereotypical examples. The implicit bias, if you remember that slide that we saw with a sample of two and a half million observations and 68% of the population has the bias that more quickly associates white pictures with good things and black pictures with bad things. That implicit bias is deeply embedded in the brain from all of the years of whatever, wherever it is that you picked up information such as this, the media, your family, interactions, uh, social structure that you've observed, social power, that needs to be reprogrammed. And the only way uh, that has been shown the most effective way of reprogramming that information for good is seeing counter stereotypical examples. This is extremely important. So if we look at counter stereotypical examples on the left, obviously President Obama, President Obama, and on the right, Ursula Burns, who worked at Xerox for many, many years and successfully led the company as CEO prior to her retirement. If we see enough of these examples, then that tells the brain, no, that's not true. Because even if a stereotypical bias is primed, then the more rational thinking, the neocortex part of the brain, tells the older part of the brain, that's not true. That may be a stereotype, a bias that many people have, but that's not true. Because if you look at all of the evidence we have to the contrary, that's, that's, a, that's a stereotype and it's false. And so seeing counter stereotypical examples helps reprogram the brain and research has shown that as well. Okay, uh, and then finally, the last piece that I'll talk about, the seventh thing that works, and I know this from personal experience, mentoring and professional networks, this works. I can tell you this because I'll give you an example of an organization called the PhD Project, which I personally have been involved with uh, as a member for 16, 17 years. The organization's mission is to increase the number of underrepresented minority faculty and business schools in the United States. When the PhD project started over 25 years ago, uh, back in 1994, there were 294 African American, Hispanic, and American Indian business school PhD faculty in the entire United States. Today, there are over 1,500. So it has more than quintupled since this organization started. And so today we have 1,500 plus African American, Hispanic, and American Indian business school faculty in the United States. So there are about 830 US accredited business schools, which means on average, you would expect to have one or two per university. Now that's still, depending on the size of your faculty, it may be two or 3%, okay? So still a severe underrepresentation at the PhD level and in academia um, given the overall proportion of the population, but that is still a substantial improvement given where we started uh, 25 years ago, which uh, as you can see here, was, would have been close to 0%, all right? So I can tell you from experience, mentoring and professional networks definitely helps as well. And so at least these are seven things from research, from experience that I can tell you do help given uh, the current situation that we see in organizations. And so that's 
that's my presentation in a nutshell. Thank you all for your attention and um, we're, we can have discussion or questions, whatever you normally do. And I apologize for the noise. We have our, our crew that does our uh, landscaping is here right now, but we'll be leaving momentarily. So thank you. Are there any questions or discussion? Uh, Professor, there are a few questions in the chat. Um, if, if you'd like, I can read them out to you. Okay, that would be great. Let me see, where can I go to see the chat? Oh, I see chat 13. Aha. Uh -huh. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Okay, I was paying no attention to this during the presentation. Shall we go through one by one? Uh, yeah, sure. to mute everyone <laughs> okay i sorry i missed this yes the the option to mute everyone which i should have done uh i apologize everyone please put yourself on mute some may not know that in your zoom setting okay sorry about that feel free to post any questions here okay oh okay apologize if this might be veering off into anthropology okay which i know nothing about but I remember from undergrad that some scientists believe racism is an evolutionary reflex, fear of disease, tribalism. Given that, how can organizations and individuals work on this deep-rooted unconscious bias? Is it even possible? Thinking of people like Amy Cooper in Central Park who was extremely educated, expressed progressive beliefs, but went to a very dark place in a moment of stress, okay. There is something, uh, there is a research paper that was published a few years into uh, President Obama's presidency called the Obama effect. So the question is related to whether it's even possible to reprogram the implicit unconscious bias. The answer is yes. There are, there are two ways. One is that it can be reprogrammed very slowly and methodically by what I mentioned earlier, seeing the counter stereotypical examples. So what this particular research study did was they looked at, it, it was done out of a research lab in psychology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, a colleague that I had, uh, Trish Devine and other colleagues, a lot of uh, doctoral students that she's worked with over the years, they initially looked at the levels of implicit bias on the black-white IAT implicit association test in the population of students at UW prior to President Obama being elected, because she has a lab and they run data every single year. And then a couple years after uh, President Obama took office, they were surveying the students again and running the implicit association test and they found that the students at the university overall bias had gone down. And so they published this paper called the Obama effect that's actually in the title. And so yes, it is possible to reprogram these things at a subconscious level. If you see enough counter stereotypical information that tells your brain that's not right. And over time, your level of implicit bias at the subconscious level can go down, yes. The other thing that I will say is that at the conscious level, you can also block a, the implicit bias can be blocked if you are not too tired or cognitively taxed. The implicit bias can be blocked because it comes from the older primitive part of the brain, the cerebellum area, this part, which is a lot more primitive. This part is more uh, evolved for rational, logical thought. The neocortex is where the decision making comes from. And this one can block this one if you are thinking and you are consciously aware of it. Like in the study with SDO, remember the, the people high in social dominance orientation did not want to pick the African-American resume, even though we had pre-tested it and we knew it was statistically significantly better. When we told them, hey, don't pay attention to anything other than what's job related, we brought their focal attention and awareness to it and gave them directions. 
And I think that's partly what happened there when we saw that that racist effect was being mitigated. Um, so yes, people do tend to go to these, their, their initial bias can be a, a prejudice, but if they are people who want to respond without prejudice, actually it was, it was Trish Devine's lab also that created a measurement instrument called motivation to respond without prejudice. And there's one factor of the scale that's an internal motivation to respond without prejudice because I think this is wrong and I don't want to act this way. And there's also an external motivation to respond without prejudice, which is that others are telling me that this is socially unacceptable behavior and I need to act in a socially acceptable way. Either way can help you consciously stop acting bias. So the question was, is it possible to stop it? The answer is yes. But what I will say is that research also shows that if people are tired, if the conscious and thinking part of the brain is tired and people are exhausted or they're overloaded and doing multitasking at the same time, more prejudice and more bias comes out because you need this thinking part uh, to really stop the, the part that's more prejudice. Um, can you talk about what interested you in this research? Some people say that research is actually me-search, meaning, okay, so my family immigrated here from Cuba, uh, and I grew up, well, one, I didn't speak any English initially, and nor any of my family, and so we arrived in the Uni United States, like, no money, no English, no education, and trying to figure out what is going on here, but very, very happy to be here very, very happy to be here and in a country where there's uh, freedom. We have the, our, you know, uh, constitutionally guaranteed freedoms here that we didn't have uh, in Cuba. So, but still, uh, one day I remember being so shocked. I was in elementary school and the children, so I grew up in Southwest Texas and we were the only uh, Cuban family around we were the only Cuban family in town, um, but there are there are a lot of uh, Hispanic people in South Texas, and primarily of uh, Mexican descent. And then there are a lot of white people. And so the kids, one day, I was kind of shocked and horrified. They're like, "Let's play dodgeball, Mexicans against whites." And I was like, "What?" And I literally just. <laughs> I stood there and I was like, I just stood by myself on the side and I was looking back and forth going, why would they have done that? And why would they, they socially categorized everybody who was Mexican went here, everybody who was white went over there and they started playing with each other. And I didn't fit anywhere. Cause I was like, well, I kind of look a little more like this group over here, but I speak Spanish. And when I go to church, I see this group. Culturally, I'm a lot more like this group. So I don't fit here and I don't know why they just did this. So it was the, the social categorization all around. And then not to mention the, the whole systemic racism and all of this, just seeing all of this and absorbing all of this as a woman, an immigrant, Hispanic, all of it just put together. Um, I've always wondered what the heck is going on here and what can we do about it, honestly. So, um, and even in, when I worked, I, I was still asking the same questions. And so eventually I left corporate and went back to study this because for me, it has been a lifelong fascination, probably because of my own characteristics. So um, that's, that's how I got interested in that. Good, I'm glad it was informative. Uh, the Obama effect was a label I developed in. Oh, Ray. All right. Very cool. Oh, and uh, thank you. Great presentation. All right. Look forward to, yeah, I look forward to meeting everyone. Um, okay. Let's see. So Ray, I'd love to talk to you about that. So the Obama effect, very cool. I'm glad, 
I'm glad that originated with, with Ray's research. I didn't know that. Thank you, Ray. Got these bright spots, the Obama effect, totally salient. Ah, and this is the paper. So Ray Friedman is uh, sending a, the paper here from 2009, Journal of Experimental Social Psychology. Okay, thank you, Ray. Apologies, I misattributed. I think Trish Devine may have done something in that area, but I may have been off the mark. Thank you. Four pages. So, let's see if there are other questions in the chat. Oh, can we discuss the glass cliff? Absolutely. Um, so the glass cliff is a newer concept and it's been studied primarily with, um, with women. This, this question I see here, can we discuss the glass cliff phenomenon when minorities in leadership roles and female political candidates are more likely to achieve leadership roles that, yeah, this is exactly what's been found. So the glass cliff, the research that I've seen and read has been primarily with women who advance to the CEO level. And right now we only have uh, about 5% in the S&P 500 women CEOs. And so this research looks at women who have advanced to very high leadership levels. And what it found was that, uh, I'm thinking about a piece by Cook and Glass that came out uh, several years ago. And it basically says women are more likely to be selected when the organization is already in a period of strain, of stress where it's not performing well, and they're looking for a big change. They're looking for a fresh person, a fresh face, a fresh CEO, fresh ideas, just something new and different who can uh, help the company and provide a new image or a new strategy, something like that. Well, that's nice, but then what happens is when that woman gets the chance to be in the CEO position, that means that she's coming in when the organization is already in a very difficult situation and the deck is stacked against her. And so what ended up happening was the findings of the study basically said, okay, you come in when the times are tough and the deck is stacked against you. Inevitably, you're more likely to fail and to resign and leave. And then they found something that by and large, the women CEOs, when they departed, were then replaced by white men CEOs, which is something that they called the savior effect in the article. Like, oh, we gave this a try. We were trying, you know, tr trying something new, trying to have an, a, a new innovative approach. We have a, a different kind of leader. And then what happens is the person doesn't do well. And then this other person is brought in to quote unquote, save the day. And so that's the paper that I've seen. Um, and I think, yes, I, I think that this would apply to uh, people of color as well. And then the question is, why do they take these assignments to begin with? And what I've seen in the literature and the way these authors kind of justified it was, well, so few women and minorities ever get that chance that when they do have that chance presented to them, they probably realize this may be my one and only shot in my career to do this. And so what do I have to lose by taking it? And then they take it and overall, what I just explained from the research findings is the experience that the majority have had. So that's what I know about the glass cliff phenomenon. And uh, are there any other questions? That's the end of the chat message from what I can see. Uh, no more questions at this time, I think. Um, and we're just about out of time. So I wanted to take this time to thank you very much, Professor Triana. Uh, this is a very informative and helpful uh, presentation. We hope that it sparks some discussion amongst um, everyone who joined.